No, but this is uh, yeah, no, it's no. going to go automatically. It's going to move. No, it's not. It shouldn't. You ask for it, you will go. It's you at the end. Here too. Yeah, I don't want it to go with the slideshow. Uh, I want to sh like to put it over there, but I need to do that as a presenter mode. You got to go in presenter mode. Yeah, I can't okay. see anything. Oh, geez. Presenter. I'm doing it on there. Presenter view. There you go. Is that what you want? But it's it's gonna go automatically. No, 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 no. You're good. No. No question. You're good. Just hit the buttons left and right. You can see there it's full screen. You're good. Okay. So, good evening, Kodesh Hi, everybody. I'm sorry for uh, the delay. And um, I want to start, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you to uh, uh, Robin for all that uh, tremendous help. Thank you, Robin. Um, so today we're going to do something very, very interesting. Many times uh, we drink wine and we say, ah, that was good, that was not good, like, you know, and, and then, for example, we're going to go to the store and we're going to ask for that wine that we tasted. So they don't have exactly the same wine, but what they said, you know, this is uh, not 2015, this is going to be 2016. Yeah, it's the same thing, exactly the same thing. And you go home and it's not exactly the same. So what happened? So we understand that the wine, not every year, it's the same because there are some other elements that impact the, the, uh, the, the wine. And actually, all those uh, factors that impact the taste of the wine, except for obviously the type of the grape, is uh, a very old uh, term that's called terroir. So, Everybody's going to practice with me. Sound like that. Tarawah. Thank you very good. Okay. So what exactly is Sawa? Um, it's how a particular region, climate, soil, and aspect, terrain, affect the taste of the wine. Okay. Some regions are said to have more Tawa than others. And what is it and how does it affect the taste of the wine? Why am I talking about that? Because today, um, you see, you have in front of you eight wines. Now, they're all cabs. These are all Cabernet Sauvignon. They're all coming from California, different places in California. They're all made by Herzog. So what we're going to do, we're going to try to eliminate a lot of the factors that impact the taste of the wine. And we're going to try to focus on those natural elements, like climate, etc., and see if we can tell the differences um, being, meaning the, those things as the uh, climate, elevation, stuff like that, and how that impacts the taste of the wine. Okay? So, um, nowadays, it is uh, used to describe particularly, you know, practically every wine region. Okay? Like, for example, we have Napa terroir, or we have Bordeaux terroir, or Washington terroir. And it uh, kind of lost the original meaning of the term. Now it's time to, uh, to kind of understand what we're talking about, because this is actually um, important. So you can see we have climate, tradition, soil, and terrain. And let's explore each one of them a little bit. Climate. 
Wine regions can be basically divided into two types of climates, cool climate and warm climate. Okay, wine or grapes from warmer climate generate higher sugar level, which produces higher alcohol wines versus cooler climate wines or grapes rather that generally have lower sugar levels and retain more acidity. Okay, pretty straightforward. Next. Soil. There are hundreds of different types of soil. Ulrich, the slides aren't moving here. On the screen, what we're seeing at home is still the intro page. It's still the intro page? Yes. Uh, I don't know why. Everybody at home see only the intro page? Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay, somebody got to help me here. I would like to say it was only Jack who only saw the intro page, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I can um, help you because obviously I'm, I'm sharing the, the screen, but it doesn't work over there. They don't see it. So let's, um, I guess let's stop the share. All right. And let's just. And don't leave, don't leave. Yeah. Okay. And just like. Is this your meeting? Yeah, that's the meeting. <laughs> and what we're going to do is we're going to share, but we're going to do it as a. Okay. What do you want them to see? Well, what we see. Yeah, for sure. Um, I would do uh, I would do PowerPoint right here. And then just do share. I know. Now open PowerPoint up down here. There we go. Soil. Okay, now we see soil. We see soil. Do you see it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, you see the... Yeah, yeah I, I see soil. I don't see climate. I see soil. Okay, so fine. Uh, so this was the second slide. This is for the Zoom people. This is... Okay, thank you, Jerry. This is the third slide where you see all the different... The terroir, right? You see the... The different elements the climate the tradition soil and terrain okay now we're in climate so the climate warm climate versus cold climate lower alcohol higher alcohol okay so you didn't miss much from the class jack okay got it that's later i understand got it. I, i'm a little behind but i got it You're a little behind yeah i get it okay soil so there are hundreds of different types of soil rock and minerals deposits in world's vineyards, but most vineyard soil can be sorted into about five or six different types of soil and that affect the flavor of the wine. Okay, now there's no scientific proof that actually those, those, those minerals affect the taste, but it, what happens is something like a, a tea bag. You know, something absorbs and, and, and from the mineral and something from the soil gets into the roots of the vines and that impact the uh, the taste, which brings us to the next one. The next one, what do we call it, terrain? Believe it or not, altitude is an increasingly important focus in the quality of vineyards. Besides elevation, things like ge geological features, like mountains, built, uh, valleys. Uh, being located uh, um, inland or by uh, body of water, flora, plants, microbes, uh, trees, large bodies of water, all that stuff affects how a wine from a particular region tastes. Okay, which brings us to a um, The new study suggests that bacteria and microbes are in a region are much more important than we ever thought. Okay. Um, in the old times, they thought it was only the soil itself, but even though they discovered it, even though you have like different soil, it still produces different, um, different wine or different tasting wines. And now we understand that it has to do with a lot of stuff inside. So it meant that every wine has a unique biological indicator 
of where it's from and even what year it was made because the conditions in the soil were unique for that particular year. And before that study, um, experts thought that soil top was the only defining features. Now, uh, it opens really a lot of opportunities and, and uh, uh, growers and winemakers actually can, in the future, at this point we don't have enough information, but at least in the future, they can probably figure out what can they add to the soil, to the ground, in order to imitate or, or change a uh, the taste of, of the grapes and create the wine that they're interested in, which is very, very cool. Which uh, brings us to the last element, which called tradition. So this is more applicable to the old world rather than the new world. And when we talk about California wines or in Israel, that's new world wines. Uh, in tradition, um, you know, we, we, talked in, we take into account stuff like um, the taste of the winemakers, the equipment, all sorts of traditions that they have in particular area in the world, how to make the wine and stuff like that. And that plays a factor in how the wine is going to taste. Why I would say that this is old world mainly and not new world is because in the new world, everybody's pretty much using the same techniques um, nowadays to uh, produce the wine. So it's not much of a uh, difference, but still um, in order, so what we did, what I did here, so the, all the wines are by Herzog. So it's the same winemaker we're talking about the same area, geographical area. It's all California, but we're going to see in a minute that it's not exactly accurate. And they're all the same type of grape. These are all Cabernet Sauvignon. And yet they're all going to taste different. So why this is a, actually a big deal? Um, Here's the next one. California have over 107, about 110 official appellations in California known as ADA, American Viticultural Areas. And that what that means, it means that even if we're talking about, for example, we're going to drink wine from three different counties, Sonoma, Napa, and uh, Lake County, within those counties, they're divided to smaller areas and only in California, you have about 110 areas like that, that they have a unique, let's call it conditions, soil, climate, uh, mountains versus valleys, all that kind of stuff that define it and, and gives a specific taste to the wine. Okay, so here's a map and you can see like how it's divided Okay, the Sonoma, so for example, you have Sonoma, you have Sonoma Valley AVA, and then you have the Sonoma Mountain AVA, which is different. Okay, and the next, and you have the Sonoma Coast AVA, which is also different. Same goes for the Napa. Okay, you have the Alexander Valley, for example, also in Sonoma, you have Dry Creek Valley AVA. So all those names, and those names are actually the names of the wines, they mean that the conditions are different enough, at least, so they'll be called as a different AVA, which is very, very special. And that's unique to California because usually if you have a, an area like Bordeaux in France or whatever that is, it's one AVA. But here things are so different in such relatively speaking small areas that it creates a different um, AVA and therefore it's a different um, conditions that, that produces different wine. Okay, so when we took a couple of facts about California wines, the first wines uh, were first vines were planted in California in the 17, the late 1700s. Commercially produced vines actually were planted in the 1800s. Um, there are over 2,000 different wineries in California, and close to 90% of all wine in America comes from California, which is remarkable. 
In California, more than 60,000 wines are being produced. And we're going to do our share tonight. Residents of California consume close to 20% of the annual production of their home state, which is pretty remarkable. Okay. A couple of fun facts about uh, Cabernet. If you want to, uh, you know, this is, you know, and uh, because we're going to drink a lot of Cabernet. Um, eight surprising facts about Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay, actually, it's a natural crossing of Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and here's the map. Okay, so you see the three counties, Sonoma County, where we have the Alexander Valley, Chalk Hill, Valhall, Trestle Glen, and Cab Ranch. These are the areas that we're going to drink from. Okay, so we have Sonoma County, we have Alexander Valley, Chalk Hill, Valhall, Trestle Glen, Cab Ranch. All that stuff comes from Sonoma County. Then we have another wine that's gonna be Lake County. And we have one from, two, I'm sorry, from Napa Valley, one is Napa Valley, is kind of a general one, and the one is Calistoga, which is also in Napa. And here's what we're drinking. Sorry. Here's what we um, what we drank, Ariella. What we drink. Okay, whatever. Okay. Um, so you have numbers. The 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 samples that you have are numbered. Feel free to start drinking. We are not going to do any blind blind tasting. Um, just drink and have fun. I think we could, uh, um, Robin, if you want to, you know, they can bring the food if you want, or whatever. I'm sorry. In the next fifteen minutes. Okay. Um, you guys at home. Hassan, are we supposed to drink in order? Of no, no, no. You can drink in any order that you want. Do whatever you want. What I recommend is um, play with the different counties. Okay, if one comes from Sonoma, Napa, and play with that. And then second time, you can play within the same county. For example, compare the Alexander with the Chalk Hill or the Trestle Glen with the Callisto. Oh, the cab ranch, you know, um, I, I'll put this back here so you can have uh, fun with that and, and see what uh, I'm going to. Um, oh, you want the, okay, here we go. That's that. Um, So we're going to take uh, kind of a like couple of minutes, just like uh, drink and enjoy. Yeah, I'm going to start with one also. Wow. Really like this one. It's very good. Number one. I, I, I like that. I'm just going to go back and forth between those two slides so you'll see. Okay, so Lake County. As you can see, it's a little bit above Napa Valley and above Sonoma County, it's just above them. And this is representative of that, obviously, of that county. I'm sorry? I think so. We passed through, yes. What? <laughs> It's Arik. Arik, don't you think it has to breathe? <laughs> Arik, Ar 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 any any comments on how much of the difference in 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 taste and and kind of okay is due to the actual location as opposed to the other variables like you know how the wine is produced, the specific vines, etc. Again, Steve, I'm sorry. 
and any comments about you know how how you can separate out what is due to what in the final product is due to the terroir as opposed to for example the specific vines uh, the winemaking process etc yeah so i think it's kind of um tricky to separate um you know sometimes as you know you have better grapes than others and that kind of stuff but um the liberty i didn't want to go with too much into that stuff because that's really dicey uh, you know whether it's elevation whether it's water and that kind of stuff but definitely all those factors are part of the game i think that like to say oh it's because it's a higher elevation it's a better wine or it tastes better i don't know I, uh, not my thing and certainly one of the things we know is that herzog is very good about producing a very consistent product year in and year out hold on hold on see what Let's say, you know, one of the things Herzog does is it really makes an effort to produce a very consistent product year in and year out. Correct. And, and when you compare stuff like that and you use the same, the same uh, winery, the same winemaker, you can try to eliminate the other, um, the other factors. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, what do we think? I like Lake County. First two. Um, number four, Alexander Valley. Number two is Napa Valley. And number six, Calistoga. Number six is Calistoga. Are so different. They're so different, it's amazing. They are. They, because it's a totally different ABA. <clears throat> wow. Totally different. Totally different. Um, I have 2016, 2017, some of them, but. So guys, like, enjoy, try to uh, play with them, try to compare between the different. Um, Twenty seventeen. Twenty seventeen. So far, is supposed to be. No. So far, is the best year in uh, in California wines. Yeah. Which year? In a very long time. And most of them are twenty seventeen. I don't know. I don't know. What's interesting, by the way, with Herzog is that you know, for many, many years, um, they bought the grapes from different uh, places all over, you know, Napa, Sonoma, uh, whatever, and um, and lately, in the last kind of, uh, I would say, ten years or so, they they realized that they need to start investing in their own land, and they started uh, buying land. So, for example, um, Cab Ranch which is um, number five, is a vineyard that is owned by Herzog. Oh. It's owned by Herzog. Mm -hmm. Can't um. hear you, what? It's proof to me that what people are willing to separate to sell you is not the best. No. Sonoma County, the Valhau. That's a that's a good wine. I had it before. I didn't have it now. Um, I don't think the I don't think I have it. No, no. We have we have plenty of everything. It's just like uh, Jared. Uh, Jared didn't do his. That's it's, it's all Jared. That's all. It's fine. It's somewhere. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Don't worry. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you, but that's uh, Robin is in charge. 
Tanya is hungry. She wants to eat. <laughs> Arik, how have the fires affected these counties? How are the fires? Yeah, which well, as long as they don't burn the the vineyards, I think they're good. They're fine. Does it affect um, the soil? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, maybe it's a long-term impact, but I don't think so. Arik, I have a question. Did yes. that Jacob hire you for your chazonis or for your enology skills? <laughs> This is, uh, this is phenomenal. I, you know, I, and I really mean it. I would not have been able to get this kind of information from anywhere else. And it is really lovely. And the way Robin Thank sets you. things up are just amazing. Thank you. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a hobby. It's a passion. Um, Liz, how is this cool? Yeah, there's there are eight caps here. I'm, uh, I'm interested. I'm interested to hear if uh, people had a chance to try seven and five, Cab Ranch and Trestle Glen. Cab Ranch, yeah. I yeah. think uh, the answer is positive. Wait, wait. Uh, Fred, I can't hear you. Just yeah, give me a sec. Hold on. Give me a sec. Okay, Fred, go. Um, we did try five and seven. That was your question, wasn't it? Yeah, it's uh, it's a uh, trestle blend is seven and cab ranch is five. And what do you think? Right. I, I think the five has a very strong, almost tobacco flavor to it, like a tobacco leaf. And, and seven, I, I actually did not care for it all. <laughs> seven, I actually found okay, honestly seven. bitter. Ah. You're a tough customer, though, Fred. We know that. I like eight. <laughs> That's been said. Before. I like eight. Eight, it's good. Well, eight's very expensive. Wow, I like them both. I have to say. I like eight. You like them both? Eight, eight. We actually, we we generally like eight. We find to be a very kind of <laughs> like if I think if I think cab and I think Chalk Hill. It's, yeah, it is the, the Chalk Hill is number eight. Yeah, I know. It, it, it's exactly what I would expect from that region, and I quite like it. You yeah. have expensive it taste. It's, it's a phenomenal yeah. wine. That's the whole wine. <laughs> What's everybody's thought about the Cab Ranch? I mean, I've never had it before, and I must say, I mean, I'm just not not really impressed with it. No, I you know what? It did put tobacco leaf in it. You said you were not impressed? The cab no. Ranch. no. Hey, I'm with you. It's cooking wine. Which? No. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to quite say that, but I, I don't enjoy it as much as the others. What, Steve? I don't enjoy the cab as much as the others. I don't think it has the depth of flavor, the balance that some of the others. I must say, uh, tasting the first few, Lake County, which I've had before, I, I happen to like. And I think that it stacks up very well, especially against the higher price Napa Valley. I don't like, didn't like Napa. There are some couple, definitely a couple of surprises here. I agree with Arik, Steve. You know, you know what surprised me, Arik, is the Valhau. Yeah. I, mean, I, I like it. Yeah. I don't think I've ever had it. We agree. So this is the Valhau also. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a good comment. Uh, I'll trade you. So, so you put things in perspective. I'll trade you two Valhau for one Scott Hill. About oh, I, haven't, I haven't tasted the job. I've saved it in a glass. Um, <laughs> We have a, a variety here of from 40, 50, 60, 70, and about 90. Oh. So, you know, you can go a little online and check what. Which one was 90? What, but it's, it's, I'm sorry? Which one was 90? I don't remember by heart, but I, I can send Talk everybody the, the prices later on. I don't remember, but uh, I have to say that, yes, uh, Lake County, number one really impressed me yeah really impressed me and it's not that expensive <laughs> well, let's try number one okay here's what i'm going to do um 
Yeah. We're going to continue um, continue drinking throughout uh, dinner, whenever that comes. If you're hungry, just you know, blame it on Robin. That's why we're doing that. Hmm. Uh, but um, I want to go into um, something else that we're going to do today. Okay, so I'm going to be um, uh, talking, and you can eat, and uh, we'll have fun. We're <clears throat> What do we have here, by the way? There's seven. Hmm? There's lots of them, but I can hardly remember one or two of them. Yeah. Okay. So, let's go to um, kind of the Jewish, the Jewish part of uh, of tonight. Huh. What? Probably what do you say? Or disappointing. Okay. Of you serpent, four disappointing, the Alexander Valley. <clears throat> That's great. Well, you kind of disagree with Jeff. Jeff did like it. I like the I like the Alexander Valley. I like the Alexander Valley. Yeah, I, I like it. The Alexander Valley is a solid wine. We yeah. know it. What do yeah, we think? Uh Orkin and Maui's over there. Any any uh... <laughs> What was the question? Okay. Somebody already drank too much. Let's put it this way. Yeah. We're just starting. Moshe and Arlene, any 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 words of wisdom for us so far? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The Kubietsky really like the Kalistoga, number six. Hmm. Uh, we would. <laughs> the 15 is, is a phenomenal um, year for the Alexander Valley, yes. Um, the Alexander Valley. I think that the Alexander Valley is a very good wine. It's just like compared like next to some of the others here. It's just not at the same, at the same level. What? So I think it's very, very cool. I've never done anything like this, like taking um, wines that are so similar, meaning the same grape, the same area, generally speaking. Uh, the same winemaker, however, you do you do tell the difference. You can see that they they taste differently, and that's because of the ABA, which is remarkable. I mean, some are high, some in the valley, some in up in the mountain, some are near body of water, some have certain um, microbes in, in in the soil, some have different type of soil, all that kind of stuff, and definitely makes an impact on the uh, alcohol wise yeah pretty much the same thing everybody is all of them is around 14 percent 13 and a half 14 14 and a half whatever they are all cabernet sauvignon no they might, they might have like lower end ones as well like from the Genesee, they have like lineage, they have like the Baron Herzog. So, so it's yes and no. In other words, it's the same grape by type of grape, not necessarily some quality. Without you, can get, you can get Cabernet Sauvignon grapes that are better than others, but they're both Cabernet. Okay, um, Larry. Without revealing the the prices of each, what is the what would you say was the lowest price, lowest and what end. was the on the lowest end, and what was the highest price of the eight that we tasted? And we, Meryl and I have made our own tasting choice. And we're just wondering what the range in prices is. <clears throat> so um, we're talking about from about $40, $40 to $90. That's the range that we're getting. Here. That's about. not really exorbitant in terms of a range. Not I mean, it, it's, it's, I guess it also depends upon if the 90 is an 
older wine in terms of the vintage as opposed to a younger oh, wine. No, they're all, everybody, all the wines here are either 2016 or 2017. No, you've got a 2013 Cabernet number seven. Uh, the crystal blend. Yeah, the crystal blend, but that was, uh, actually, it's, a, it's an interesting, guys, this is actually a very interesting point that Larry brings up. Um, we all we all know that, um, you know, that uh, notion that let the wine age, right? And then it becomes better. That is true for old world, old world wines. Actually, when it comes to new world wines, not true at all. Not true at all. The wines do not, I mean, they age, but their, um, their taste does not improve with time. Absolutely not. So that's, that is uh, correct when it comes to California wines. If we were if we were to look in wine connoisseur and look at these, would these be ratings in the nineties? Um, All of them would be. I think so. I hope so. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know enough about like the poker industry and who rates it, but in the wine connoisseur the, is an interesting because they don't they don't um, penalize kosher vineyards, which is interesting. There are others that do, and but Wine Connoisseur is one of the few that doesn't. So that's why I was just wondering. But mm -hmm. they're, they're really, they're, there's that's such a question. broad taste between all these wines. Um, it's really interesting. Well, Arik, I have two really, questions. And, um, Arik, I have two questions. It I could be interesting, like, you know, playing with, with that and kind of try to eliminate the, the other factors and stick with one great one one major one area but within that you have um huge variety hmm. are, okay. these, are these so, wines bushel or or not Mabushal? on some leaf yeah are the wine are these wines the bushel or not Mabushal? Are there differences there um, I, Except for two, except for two, I, uh, I have to check it out. I think most of them are non mabushal Yeah, usually they're not in California. And most of them are non mabushal here, but uh, definitely some of them. I know that the Alexander, the Napa, those are mabushal But um, why the is not mabushal I don't remember. No. Don't why know. did they? Why did they bottle some of them in the demi bottles? Was, was there a, was it a cost issue, or they think it's a better wine? What or why would why would they decide to put them in the small bottle? Again, what what was the question? Two of the two of the wines came in demi bottles. In, in yeah, I just I couldn't get uh, the regular size bottles. That's that's all they uh, had at uh, at the winery. So, but do all of them come in that in the in the demi bottles also? You can order them that way as well. No, I think they have um, certain wines in semi bottles, but. We just um, um, they were running low or whatever. That's that's what I was able to get. Okay, Rabbi, any are uh, causing any particular reason you didn't oh, do the Rutherford? Uh, question from from here, yeah, Jeff. Yeah. So Jeff Warber is asking a question. He said, if you have the same, like two wineries and the conditions are the same, how come they're going to taste the same? They're going to taste differently. But basically, first of all, we're talking about like the winemaker, the decisions that the winemaker is, is going to make, when to um, get the, the, the grapes, you know, whatever, a couple of things, what to add, how, when, um, how long in each barrel, all that, all that kind of stuff. Number two, it's almost impossible to get the same AVA um, because every area is going to be a different. So if you have winery over there, chances you're going to have another kosher winery in the same AVA, very slim, very slim. Okay, um, we are getting our dinner. I think so. Um, so um, 
Guys, feel free to continue drinking and um, and enjoy your dinner. Um, six is very interesting. I agree with you. <laughs> Not so much. Not so much. Awesome. What was your comment on six? Yeah, that's what I said. That's part of tradition. Absolutely. So, what was your comment? Um, comment, comment on ca on Calistoga on number six. Yes, please. So Calistoga comes from a, it's an area in Napa Valley. It's an AVA in Napa Valley, and um, you know it's a single vineyard. Uh, I don't know what's the name of the vineyard for what, you know, they got it. I don't think it's the, it's their vineyard. I don't think it's the Herzog vineyard. I think they, they buy the, the grapes over there, but it's uh, in Calistoga, <laughs> in Calistoga, which is in Napa Valley. Um, and it's uh, its own AVA, uh, just like Valhall, like, uh, like other places like the Alexander Valley, like Crystal Glen, etc. These are the, and more specific within the Napa Valley. So you have the Napa Valley, which is kind of a general, like from, they get, they get the grapes from the entire Napa Valley from several places probably. And you can compare it to the Calistoga where it's a single vineyard uh, from only that particular AVA. Cousin, and, I'm, yeah. I'm, um, I'm just curious if there's any reason you didn't do the Rutherford for, uh... An example of a Napa Valley AVA. We did the Rutherford last time. Ah, oh, you did, okay. We did it last time. That, yeah. that was uh, our choice last time for a uh, can. Yeah. So I, didn't want I, think that's pretty, I think that's a pretty nice example of a Napa Valley Herzog. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, you know, yeah. I can go with something else. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's the Napa Valley in Calistoga. Mm -hmm. It's also a very good point. The Rutherford. For its uh, my personal taste, by the way, for for its uh, for its uh, price, I think it's a little bit overpriced. Mm -hmm. I think they're yeah, like, I actually like the Hagafen know. in Napa Valley. All the Hagafen wines better. Yeah, well, Hagafen is a whole different story. I mean, we're yeah. not dealing with it. <clears throat> okay, guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're in Hagafen. Yeah. Okay. Um, how's the food, guys? Right. Yes. Well, it's interesting. It's an interesting question. Iris is asking if these are 100% caps. So here in America, you'll be surprised that you can get away with 20% of other stuff, and it's still you're still allowed to call it cap. I'm not going to say it. So you don't know. But, but those are at least 85, if not more, of uh, okay. Kazan, are Israeli wines are Israeli wines that come from, let's say, the Golan or the Shomron or even the South, are they considered New World or Old World at this point? Uh, Israeli wines are also New World, definitely, because the the division is based on the methods in which we, you know, how we make wine, kind of. and um, so it's definitely New World. I mean, the old world is France, is Italy, Spain, some of the places. Um, you know, when you have like a, a local tradition of wine making, we don't have that in Israel. We don't have that in uh, in uh, California. You would you would look at Castell as more of an old world uh, production. It's definitely new world because you look at the everything is old world. So you know, Arik, um, the glasses is old world, but, but their, their their practice is kind of new world. Arik, look at the machinery. Look at the, that stuff. Arik, the Tofa Winery. Uh, David, do you mind going with me on a tour? Yeah, yeah we're, just, we're, we're just talking. talking. We're we're just the, 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 the vineyard of the Tofa Winery um, is from France, and he prides himself on producing in Israel old world wine, and he called it out to us when we went on a tour. Remember that, guys? 
Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. We're, we we just that. mentioned it just prior to you saying it, Jen. <laughs> right. You gotta understand something. And we're gonna do it in one of the future tastings. Um, when it comes to Israeli wine, Israeli wines um, started by bringing vin bringing vines from France. Okay. So it's it's old world by but you know. I guess you could call it all wrong, but in terms of the techniques, I don't think so. Not anymore. Maybe a hundred years ago. Did anybody rank the wines? Did anybody rank the wines on a you know on the uh, you know seventy five and up scale as a way of measuring and keeping track? I'm curious. I'm curious what what, what scores might have been if you did that. I always did that. Sorry, Jack, Jack, I'm sorry. What, what, what I'm guys, saying is, you know, when I go to a winery on a tour, um, you know, I usually go to, you know, two or three wineries and I'm in Israel, and I just keep my own score of every bottle that I drink, and I rate it, you know, you know I think this is an 84. You know, it's like I was rogue or something, right? You know, and I just, but yeah, I come up with a number that is, to me, this yeah, is what I think. Jack, you're better than rogue. You're better. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I better be considering where he is. Yeah, but, um, it's over. <laughs> hey guys, have, have fun. Like, let's, um, you know, five minutes. I'm gonna try to. Robin, you want to tell us what we're eating? Robin. Uh, the slide. Yes. Okay, everybody, if you if if you want to know what you're eating. Uh, Where it's coming from? Is it kosher? Okay, don't tell them. <laughs> no, I'm not crazy about that. I like your uh, cake better. Bill, I think that Holmes didn't hear anything. Any chance you can repeat that in the mic? No, the, the care. I mean, they know what the London broil, sausage cuts, whatever that means, roast potatoes, what? Green beans, and butternut squash, something. Where, 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 what, um, who was the caterer? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Ness. I don't know what that is, but yeah, now you got guys, you got the information. Number seven, I didn't like Cost, it. Could we do a tasting off of the guy that uh, Larry Stern all referred us to for the Israeli wine club at some point in the future? Um, I'm not so sure. Oh, Larry, those wines have been excellent. I've, every one of them has been really good wine i want you to know i personally stomped out mm -hmm. all the grapes mm -hmm. on all the wines that you have tasted i could tell actually i could tell that larry I just thank you <laughs> ellie <laughs> has ellie has done an amazing job in providing us a variety of wines i don't know whether any of you got the scotch that he sent <laughs> the, golani? the golani it is really <laughs> considering it's israel's First um, real attempt. It's pretty really close to, to the Blarney stuff. <laughs> when you drink the one, when you eat, try to drink while you eat at the same time. Let the, the flavors of the wine going to be, you know, much stronger and, and much better with with the food. So Larry, I would add to what Dr. Katzen just said and say that each shipment that Ellie has provided, I think, has gotten better and better and better. I think the last shipment was exceptional. Yeah. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the next one. So thanks for sourcing that. I think it's really been a, a phenomenal, um, multiple multiple goods have come out of that. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. And let me eating. the first one, not the latter ones. Um, I want to move into the, uh, the main part of, of tonight. And Larry, sorry, Larry, um, my father-in-law just asked if you were wearing your socks when you stomped. He was hoping you were. It is a main <laughs> shirt, but it's, that's, that's not the main shirt. Okay. <laughs> so, 
Continue eating, drink, have fun, and let's delve into something. So I'm very happy that um, Jeremy got our attention to uh, change the menu from Turkey to um, something else because uh, that gave me an idea to what to speak about. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to speak about Turkey if we had Turkey. We'd be like hey, Deb? Come here. But, um, chicken. It's about Turkey or kosher. Undoubtedly, the, as the Jewish bird. Therefore, it's very surprising to uh, discover that uh, chicken is not actually mentioned in the Bible at all, not even once. And that's because the, and that's because, as you can see, the chicken was not mentioned in the Bible. That's because the chicken was not in Eretz Israel, was not in Israel during the time of the Bible. So chickens were actually domesticated from a jungle fowl, Asian, Asian jungle fowl, about a couple of thousands of years ago. And it took a long time until they made it to Israel. And during the time of the Mishnah, um, already chickens were very, very uh, popular, common in Israel, and they are mentioned many, many times in the Mishnah and the Talmud. And slowly the chicken became the Jewish bird. I mean, just think about chicken soup. I mean, it's very Jewish. How can you do it? So why am I talking about that? First of all, because this is a pre-Thanksgiving uh, dinner. We're going to talk about turkeys in a minute. But in 2017, there was a major controversy in Israel. A certain group of people claimed that all chickens that are commercially sold in the last couple of years or so, they are not kosher. So much so that they said that on streets, uh, broadside, on, on the streets of Jerusalem, declared that eating chicken is like eating mice and cats. And not only that, only one rare breed of chicken called Brackle. And that was imported from Belgium. That's the only one that is, it was declared by the importers as the only kosher chicken, only one that is truly kosher. Yeah. <laughs> as a response, what happened? Many poskim declared that the brackle itself is not kosher. And because of that controversy, as a consequence to that, some people started avoiding eating chickens altogether and started eating only turkey, which is very, it's rather ironic considering the history of the status kosher of the turkey that we're going to talk about in a minute. So let's, uh, in order to understand this, the subject fully, we have to go back to the Chumash and to the Mishnah. Okay. Unlike fish and unlike mammals, the Torah doesn't give us any identifying characteristics for birds to determine that they're a kosher. Instead, okay, instead, there's a list of the birds that are not kosher. And if you look, this is the list in Vayikra 11, verses 13 through 19. You know, all sorts of the following you shall eat. Those are kosher, those are not kosher, etc. Those, all that stuff is not kosher. And that means the birds that are not kosher are listed by the Torah means the logic is that all other birds, all the ones that are not listed, are kosher. Right? I think it's simple. Oh, no. It's not that simple. The ad identifying those, uh, the kosher birds, is not that simple because of two major problems. The first one is many of the non kosher ones, Torah says, leminehu and its entire species. And that creates a problem because we're not sure what kind of birds are included in that species and how much that species is 
included in the definition of the species, and it's, it's clear that the definition of the Torah is different than the definition of science. Second problem we're dealing with is we're not sure what the Torah means. So for some of the birds, we're, we're sure, like, you know, we're 99% sure. Like, for example, um, the, uh, the vulture, the griffin vulture, or the stork, mm-hmm. or the crow, or the bat. But for the rest of them, we're not sure actually what it exactly, what kind of birds they are that the Torah is talking about. And for others, we can only guess, an educated guess, but at the end of the day, it's guess. So, the difficulty to identify um, the birds that are kosher from the Chumash um, itself mm-hmm. led, um, what happened here? I'm missing. <laughs> about that? Hold on. Let me saw those. Yeah. Um, led the rabbis to give three signs, distinguishing signs between the non kosher and the kosher birds. So the Mishnah says, When it comes to animals, mammals, we learn the signs of what's kosher, what's not kosher, it's given from the Torah, the Torah tells us. However, when it comes to the birds, the Torah doesn't tell us what's kosher, what's not kosher, it just gives us a list. Therefore, the rabbis added a piece of information, all over the rest of it. Okay, any, any um, bird that is a, a prey bird, a prey bird, is not kosher. In addition, kol sheyesh lo etz ba yetera, have an extra toe, and the, okay, we're going to talk about that stuff in a second, crop. And a third thing, kol kevanoni klaf, third one is killable um, uh, gizzard. Those are signs that, according to Chachamim, supposed to tell which birds are, are kosher. <laughs> okay, what are those signs? The first one that the Chazal is talking about is extra toe. It's not that simple. Okay, you see an extra toe here. It's not that simple because most of the birds have the same number of toes. We're going to see in a minute uh, the Rashi. Rashi says that extra toe, it means that um, there's a toe in the back of the foot. Okay, like here, it's in the back of the foot. And this is a very acceptable sign and according to Rashi, for example, the vulture doesn't have that. And um, the extra toe is much less developed than in other chickens, uh, other, other birds. Okay. The second one is a zeppet, cord, which is an outpocketing of the esophagus found in many birds. Okay. You can see it's, it's this thing. Yes. What did I say? Oh, I'm sorry. It's a, yeah, it's a crop. It's a good thing that we have uh, an expert here. The main function of the zephyr, of the crop, is storage of food. All right? Um, certain birds, like gull and the penguin, don't have a zephyr altogether. And actually, there's a large variety of of sizes and shapes or whatever, but according to the Gemara, some of them are not considered to be a zephyr altogether a crop. By uh, birds of prey, 
um, many of those Zepex is just a widened area of the esophagus. And the Rishonim actually explained that that kind of Zepex is not considered to be a Zepex according to Hazal. And that's actually contradicted the uh, zeology that see that as Zepex, but that's beside the point. And so having that is also a good indication whether the bird is kosher or not. The third one, this is called Kevanoni Club, peelable gizzard. We're talking about the pupik, and we call it in Yiddish, right? The pupik. And it's got to be peelable. So um, many of the birds, the birds don't have teeth, right? So they can't grind, they can't chew the food. And the digestion is actually happening in their here, in the abdomen. So inside they have two chambers. And the, and the food goes between the two chambers back and forth until it's fully digested. The first one um, kind of produces uh, gastric juices for chemical digestion. And the second one is the muscular stomach. And nose as gizzard or cooking. I'm listening. You know, this is where the food is being digested mechanically by grinding for little pieces. So, Birds that eat worms and insects and seeds and all that kind of stuff, they're usually they're kosher and they have that um, muscle, muscular gizzard for the purpose of grinding. Birds of prey that eat fish and meat, so usually their pupic is used for mainly for storage and not for grinding, and that type of kulkevan uh, doesn't have the outer layer of muscles that actually you can peel off. And therefore, this is also a good indication whether the bird is kosher or not. Okay? Now, in, in addition to that, the Mishnah said that um, a bird is kosher what? what? It's off Doris, a, prey, a, a bird of prey is also a tame. It's not, it can't be claws or prey. It's Doris, it can't be kosher. Now, the question is, what is it? What does it mean? So some explain that the meaning is that the bird hold, is holding its food down with its foot and tearing pieces of it. Okay, that's what it means, Doris. A different uh, interpretation is that it eats its prey while it's still alive. And the third interpretation is that the bird mowing, killing its prey with its claws. Okay? So these are the three interpretations of what exactly it means of Doris. Now, According to Rashi, by the way, this is Rashi. To be impressive, I found the picture because he lived way before cameras were invented. Um, the bird is kosher only if A, must have all three signs that we talked about. Two, must be known to be non-predatory and because of the story that happens in the Gemara, whatever, Rashi says it's very difficult to understand whether a bird is indeed predatory or not. And therefore, what? It must have a tradition of being kosher. Means if we don't have a tradition, if this particular bird is not being eaten for generations, and we consider that as kosher for generations, we can't eat it. Even if it's even if it's not a predatory burden, also if it has the three signs. Unlike Rashi, Rav Moshe Bar Yosef, I couldn't find his picture because he lived also in the time of uh, Rashi, but he lived in the Bona, so that's the, just the symbol of the city in Provence. Um, he had a different opinion, and his opinion says that what? That all the non-kosher birds are listed and none of them have those three signs of kashur and therefore 
any bird that have those three signs that the Mishnah talks about automatically is kosher and automatically is not a, a predator. Okay, and most of the most of the um, with him. And it's very, it became common. However, however, the opinion of Rashi was found by the Shulchan Aruch and it became the Halakha. However, the need to make a, to determine whether a bird is kosher or not was accepted only as a stringency. And as we're going to see in a minute, that stringency was not always followed. Now, it's going to bring us to the story of the turkeys. The turkey status as kosher is one of the most stories in the history of Kashul. Now, as we said, it's widely accepted that a bird is eaten only if we have a tradition and a sora that indeed it is kosher. Now, turkeys <laughs> native only to America. So there's, there couldn't be a tradition about the turkey. Why? Because there was no Jew in America until 1685. But when it was here. So there couldn't be a tradition about turkeys. In spite of that, though, the turkey was accepted immediately, almost universally, among all Jews as a kosher bird. And the question whether it is kosher, whatever, all those discussion about turkeys actually started 300 years after the turkey was discovered. And, all, and also then the discussion was why the turkey is kosher rather than whether the turkey is kosher. In order for us to understand how that happened, we have to trace the history of the turkeys. Mm. That's why I said it's a good thing we didn't um, have turkeys today. Okay. So the first point we need to uh, pay attention to is that even the name turkey in English or in Hebrew, Tarnagol, Hodu, right? Attests to the fact that there's initially there was much of confusion about the origin of that bird. Turkey, Turkey obviously the land. Hodu is India. So what happened in the 16th century? A very interesting bird came to Eng to England, and the bird was brought by um, Turkish merchants that were trading in the Eastern Mediterranean. That was part of the um, Turkish Empire, and this is how it received its name, Turkey, because of the place, Turkey, the land. So many thought that the bird actually came from India due to the false uh, assumption that interesting new things come from the East. There was this misconception that India and the New World were the same, and therefore the bird received its name Hodu, but in Hebrew it's Tarnagol Hodu, basically it's Indian bird. And it's actually, it's called like that way in, in many other languages. But actually it's possible that the bird made it to England, it made the bird, it's actually the bird made it to England um, during that time in the 16th century was not even a Tarnagol Hodu. There's a very good chance that it was not even a turkey. You see, in the 16th century, two new birds were introduced in Europe. The first one was the American wild turkey, this guy. The second one was the African wind fowl, this guy. And they were both called turkey at that time, or Turkish hen or Indian hen, or even Malagris. And it got even more confusing, considering the fact that many called turkey a big chicken. And in the 19th century, 
there was a many Asian chickens were imported. Therefore, in the halachic responsa, from that time, it's almost impossible to determine what are we talking about, what kind of chicken we're talking about. There was a tremendous confusion. Hmm. And concerns about the, um, of Kashrut, of that Turkey, first were, first were first raised in the 19th century, many, many years after the Turkey was already um, earned its status as kosher among the Jews. Some of the poskim said, like, uh, like Rav Isaac Sher and the Kafaim, justified the eating of the turkey by the fact that says, well, the fact that everybody's eating it for 300 years, it means that there is a tradition. And where this is, tradition is coming from? The Indian Jews. It's called Indian turkey. It's Indian chicken. It comes from India. There's a, there's a tradition. But those who realize that turkey actually came from America and not from India, think for it a little bit more complicated. Because there's no possible tradition for a turkey. And you have to understand that declaring that the turkey is not kosher meant that many Jews, kosher Jews, innocent Jews eating the turkey for many, many years are sinners. Mm -hmm. So there are two major reasons to avoid such such, such ruling that the turkey is not kosher. The first is based on what the Gemara says. Mm -hmm. The Talmud says, God does not allow the righteous to unwittingly sin. Okay, that's the number one. And if Jews ate it for 300 years, righteous Jews ate it for 300 years, there's no way God let that happen. Let them sin like that. Number two, because we don't want to smear in previous generations. You don't want to say the previous generation, oh, they didn't know what they're doing, they were sinners and all that kind of stuff. It's a major principle in Judaism. So therefore, we had to find justification and to prove that the turkey is indeed kosher. So the Natsiv, I found it, said the following, that since the Turkey gained widespread acceptance among all the Jews, one cannot object to, no objection should be raised in the absence of overwhelming evidence that it, it is actually uncool. So basically the Nazi says, unless you bring overwhelming proofs that this bird is not kosher, you can't say that it's, that it's trade. It, it has to be kosher. I don't care about science. I don't care about that, all that stuff. Others argue that the supporting, other argues supporting that actually the turkey is indeed kosher based on reality. The Shoel Omeshim, very important halakhic figure at that time, says that the halakha follows of Moshe Bar Yosef opinion and not the Rashi opinion, meaning that three signs are enough. You don't need a tradition. The tradition is only a chumrah, it's only a stringency. You don't need that. And the acceptance of Turkey itself, the fact that people are eating it for already 300 years, that fact already by itself proves it is an accepted ruling and no need to follow the stringency of Rashi and the Shulchan mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the Baal Rugot Avosem says something similar. He says that the requirement of a tradition only for birds about which there is doubt if they are predatory. If a bird has been observed for a long period and never shown signs of being predatory, then it is kosher if it has the three signs, even without the tradition. Which makes sense because there is no tradition for Turkey. And some suggest that actually that idea was accepted before the Shulchan Aruch Psaq about requiring a tradition, which makes sense because first the ones who ate the 
the Turkey to our Jews in the East, because the Turkey made it to the East first before it made it to Europe. And they ate it based on the three signs, and they didn't, they didn't think you needed tradition. And then the Jews in Europe, based on the Jews in the East, in India and other places, ate it because they had a tradition, which makes sense because that was before the Shoshana War. Fast forward to the 19th century. <laughs> In addition to the controversy about the turkeys, um, the first controversy about chickens happened in the 19th century. In 1839, the Opium War, where the British forced China to open its uh, ports to foreign merchants, and in, in 1840, uh, Chinese trading ships reached Europe, carrying weird kind of chickens that were called the Shanghai birds. Later on, they're known as the Kuchins. The Shanghai birds looked like chickens, the regular chickens that we're used to in Europe. However, they were bigger and they had uh, feathered, feathered legs. And many of the people at that time were unsure where the Kuchins are actually kosher or not. And that started uh, great confusion and disagreement among the rabbis, whether the Kuchins that were called also a Kivritzer hands or Englisher hands or Americanischer hands, you know what to call them, um, are actually chickens or some other type of bird. And this reminding you, this is happening still while the debate about the Turkey is still happening. Now today, we are clear that the Kuchin is another type of chicken, while the wind, uh, the wind fowl is actually a different type of bird. But at that time, things were not that clear. And the Halakhaba, those two birds, were still debatable. In Jerusalem, in Spa, in Tveria, in England, most of the Jews actually ate the Kuchin, and other communities in Europe, it was still, it was still debatable. Um, I don't know why all that stuff is moving. So some of the Puskim, like the Maharam Shif, forbade the eating of the Kuchin because they consider them as new species. And you can't eat a new species without the tradition. Others allowed to eat the kitchen because they saw it as a bird with a tradition. And others said it was permitted even without the tradition. And two long um, uh, two both were written about that and we the Baal Shalom Tiv and the Elgot of Osam, and we, and we um, already said that. Now, the Arab Shalom Taubis add that the opinion of Rashi, that you need also a tradition, was adopted only as an extra stringency. And therefore, you can eat the Kuchin based on those three signs. And he says that also there are other reasons why you can, you know, the Kuchins are considered to be kosher. They are similar to regular chickens. They freely mingle with regular chickens and they're interbreed with regular chickens. And that last point is extremely important dealing with a statement in the Gemara in the whole. The statement says, Kosher animals cannot interbreed with non-kosher animals. That's the statement in the Gemara. <sighs> Therefore, it means that the status of unknown animal can be determined whether it's freely, freely inbreeds with a kosher one. If it does, it means that it is kosher animal. Now, the Gemara doesn't, the Gemara doesn't say whether that applies to chickens as well or not. And when it comes to the Rambam, 
down his picture. Um, it's not clear also, but he's even more general. He said, Evitam, 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 whole cloud. He said, the kosher one does not interbreed with the non-kosher one. He doesn't talk about mammals, animals, birds, whatever, it doesn't say anything. And then the Nitziv actually says that it includes all types of animals, also birds and everything. Now that, that, that is extremely important point because they say that even if the rule does not apply to chickens, or birds in general, and even if sometimes a non-kosher one in interbreed with a kosher one, the fact that they very often interbreed and they produce offspring that are not sterile, it means that our are the same type. And that means that the questionable type is also Kosher, which brings us to declare that the Kuchins were kosher and all other types of birds. Just a side note, on Sunday we went to like a farm like in Santa Clarita and I happened to see um, the Kuchins over there. And this guy I saw, the Kuchin, I saw, I saw the Plymouth Rock. And I saw, of course, the uh, brackle there. So if you want to see them, you can. It's not so far from here. OK. Now, today, science also supports this idea. And we can see that all those types of, of um, birds are actually Kosher. I'm missing a lot of slides here. Now let's talk about the brackle and what happened in 2017 and that controversy. So the Cuchin, as we said, uh, they're all birds, right? The Cuchin was one of the birds that were used to create the Plymouth Rock. Okay, now, probably they used uh, to create or to interbreed the Plymouth Rock were also like the Malai, this type of chicken, and the Brahma, mm -hmm. this type of chicken, and the Dorkin, okay. this chicken. And what happened is 1950, the Plymouth Rock was crossed with the Cornish the Cornish game hen, in order to create the Cornish rock, which is what we eat uh, not tonight, but that's what we eat nowadays. So the, the chickens that we eat today are all descendants of all, sorts of all sorts of chickens whose kosher status was debated in the 19th century. And actually the chickens today are in a very similar situation to the status of the turkey in the 19th century. Now, what happens is, fast forward to 2017. About 20 years ago, Rav Bosner, this guy, Rav Bosner, expressed a concern that the chickens that we eat today are not the same chickens that they used to eat in Europe before World War II. And he's right, yeah. not the same chickens. In the last few decades, um, uh, the commercially sold breed of chickens were result of hybridization with all kinds of, of birds. And he was afraid that they come, perhaps some of, some of those chickens, they come from a, their different species or whatever different type. And therefore that might be not kosher. And there was a fear some of those birds are not kosher and there's no tradition about them and who knows what, what we're eating today. 
Because of those concerns, there was a group of people, not these, just, just an image, mm -hmm. that called themselves the Committee for the Purity of Chickens. And they started making a major research trying to find chickens with pure ancestry. Okay. So after a very long research, traveling the world and so on, they decided that a particular chicken from Belgium, the Belgian breed called Brackle, is the right candidate. Mazel tov. So, <laughs> with the help of some investor, actually from somebody from the other side of town, <laughs> they developed, uh, they produced a way to uh, produce the brackle in commercial, like in a commercial volume, and they started to raise them in Moshav Kaoz, not very far from Beit Shemesh, and the brackle got the askama, the approval of Rav Chaim, of Rav Nesim Karlitz, from uh, the Beidin of, of, of Karlitz, from Nebrak. And it's probably had the Vaad, that, that group of people, had the Vaad only suggested the Brackle as an alternative, probably there would, not, there would be no controversy. But the problem was that they decided to um, say that only the brackle is kosher, saying that's the only one is kosher, everything else is not kosher. And of course, what happened with other Puskim and the Kashrut organizations, <laughs> the opposite. They say that the chickens that are available in the market are kosher, but however, the brackle that came out of nowhere, we don't know about it, and no tradition, therefore, you can't eat it. Make a long story short, in September 2017, all 7,000 brackle turkeys that were in Moshav Kaoz and sold for the outrageous price of about $20 a pound. And the owner of the cook in Moshav Tao said he's no intentions of raising more, and I don't know if anyone else continues to raise the brackle. But the issues raised in the controversy are leading many people to avoid eating the commercially available breeds of chicken. So what is going on exactly? What is the underlying source of the brackle dispute? valid halachic arguments were made on both sides. But it's very clear that when one group declares that only their candidate is kosher and everything else is not kosher, then the other group is going to defend the practice and going to fight any drastic change. In addition, the livelihood of many people on both sides was in danger, and I'm sure it played a major role. The you know, that group of people, they tried to, um, to completely destabilize the whole uh, industry, the entire, to bring down the entire industry, but not only that they were not successful, but also the cash of the status cash of the brattle that they suggested was debatable. And before we um, go into that, um, about the, the findings about the chickens, it is important to note that the halachic reality does not always concord with the scientific reality. It's sufficient to say that all chickens are descendants, domesticated descendants of the jungle fowl and their development occurred thousands of years ago. As the Nitzib mentioned already, and Rav Shalom was more than a hundred years ago, Chickens that interbreed very often in a natural way, they produce offspring, it means that they are the same type and therefore kosher. Today, we have even a better reason to say that, that all turkeys are from the same 
This is a, not because only they're interbreed, but because also they're fertile, the, the offspring are fertile. Nonetheless, also, um, in the 19th century, we have proven and understandable knowledge how those species, how those types were created. Birds and, and, and animals from the same type, from the same species, can look very different after what we call selective breeding. So selective breeding is a process that people used and are still using to develop varieties of the same species. Okay, so when you have um, when you have offspring that are slightly different than the parents, right, mutation, and genetic mutations are responsible for little differences like shape and size and color, but they can change also characteristics like like the number of toes, and those um, offsprings are crossed together or breed together, and they have offspring that look like them. And this is how we have a different, a new variety of the same type of the same species. Many animals and uh, plants go through uh, that process. And in fact, the two dogs that we have today show, testify the, the success of selective breeding. All different types of dogs that we have today that were developed by selective breeding come from one type of dog. The same thing happens to chickens. With enough time and effort, we can develop different types of chickens based on the, those principles of selective uh, breeding. And these are different types of chickens, but they're all mutation from the same chicken breed with each other. And the chicken industry um, didn't uh, breed different species of birds, but rather between chickens with different mutations. And all those different types of chickens that today we're talking about several hundreds of chickens with <laughs> new developments every, every year almost, they're all one species, they're all chickens, and they're all kosher. Chickens are chickens, <laughs> chickens, and um, they all mate they all have offspring, they're all fertile, they all can have new offspring. They all come from the jungle fowl, they all come from the same place, the same origin, and they're all kosher. Thank you. Shukar. So having determined that they're all chickens, did the Rebbeim poskin as to what the best pairing is with wine? <laughs> the, rabbi, the rabbi did not ask in which uh, chicken is best with wine. People tend to say that Pinot is best to go with um, turkey. And since I don't drink Pinot, we don't have turkey here. <laughs> no, just kidding. It's because of Jeremy. We don't have turkey here because of Jeremy. Because he said he hates turkey. Awesome. <laughs> Just kidding. Jeremy said that we're all going to have turkey for Thanksgiving. It's enough. We don't need to have turkey here. Hazen, in a number of the both agricultural as well as in the animal production, they're beginning to use a fair amount of what I'm going to call genetic selection to um, breed out various kinds of either disease or favorite characteristics. <laughs> How, if anything, does that affect kashras? If it does. So if we're talking about the same species, the same, it's like, you know, differences of mutation, but they're all the same. You know, we're talking about the same species, the same types, then there's no issue. If we're talking about the breeding with different types of birds or different types of animals, then we then we have an issue. That's that's basically uh, what we stand with that. Yeah, breeds are fine as long as it's the same breed, the same species. Sorry. Correct, and that's the proof that there's the same the same type. Correct, that's the proof. 
All right. All right. Yes. Um, I once heard somebody say that there was a machlokus as to whether or not you could eat, say, a chicken and mix it with dairy. Is there such a thing? Yeah. I'm a Rabbi Lewis is that? No. Bottom line is no. There's no machloka. You cannot eat chicken with dairy. <laughs> That's the bottom line. But historically, there was a custom in the times of the Mishnah. Um, in some places, place of Rabbi Yossi Agali, you, you know, they had a tradition that you could do that because the Torah doesn't talk about chicken, but rather only about um, correct. But that train has left the station thousands of years ago. Like, uh, it's, maybe this, you know, we can talk about it at some point in the future, but that, that's no, no hazard to eat uh, dairy with chicken. No, no, no. Um, Jeff, want to add anything uh, to that stuff? Mm -hmm. There's got to be. There's got to be. I mean, if, if they don't have the three, all the three signs, there's nothing to discuss. But they're not going to interbreed if they don't have the. So it kind of goes together. Okay. I'm going to. Um, um, try to come out from here. Jared, help me. Thank you. I didn't know there was an issue with chicken. See? Let me just come out of here for a second. Help me. I don't know why this is so difficult. I've done it a million times. What do you mean? To come out of this, I don't want to. I don't want to. That. Give it a second. And we're going to. We're not sharing anymore, right? Uh, I just double check. Okay. You are not sharing anymore. Okay. Uh, no. Good. Okay. <clears throat> so officially, this is the the end of our program, guys. Um, Guys, you're going to stay and smooth a little bit. But, um, I hope you had a good time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, if anyone wants to know what's the prices of those wines, I'm happy to send it uh, tomorrow. But at that point, um, this is going to leave this way. And you can actually, I'm going to turn the computer so you can see the guys and the setting. Thank you, Arik. Thank you, Arik. Thank you, Arik. Thank, thank, thank you, Robin. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Ark. One, three, five, six, seven. Thank you. <laughs> Double fisted, Jack. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ark. I want I want to know everybody's favorite wine though. <laughs> number two. Okay. Number three. Napa Valley, Valhalla. Number four. Valhalla. Valhalla. I like I number one. numbered ones. It's hard to choose one. I think one, four, and eight were great. The lake, the Alexander, and the Chalk Hill. Although the I Chalk agree. Hill, I would admit, is probably a little overpriced. Mm. Yeah. So I, I, I rated the Chalk Hill. It was the only 90 that I gave. Mm -hmm. um, I actually rated Alexander Valley 89. And the surprising for me, well, as Calistoga 86. And I wow. about how 88. I mean, so that's how I, I, I was surprised. How did Jack, how did you like the lake? Number one. Okay, so I didn't, you know, um, I rated that 83. Mm -hmm. um, I found number seven very thin. Yeah. You know, I rated that 84. What? You know, so, um, and I didn't like number five. You know, Jack, it's very hard to get kosher ripple. <laughs> <laughs> it's very very hard oh, man. what about thunderbird <laughs> that you can get <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> this is, but you know what? I, I find it fascinating because I, I mean, I drink all of these wines. I've never drink them and compare them at the same time. Of course. Yeah. So now I kind of have to rethink. But it's it's also an individual taste. What you uh, no, it's all, it, but yeah, any 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 wine taste, and it's like all of us will like wine, but our taste will be mm -hmm. different. Of yeah. course. And so you can't say, well, you know, this guy knows, and this is the way it is, because you either like, you know, I've had wines that like, you know, would be rated like a ninety two or ninety four, and I don't like it, and they'll have a wine that's like an eighty eight or eighty six, and I like it. So mm -hmm. it, it's all very personal. For me, it depends upon if the bottle's in a bag or <laughs> if I've got the bottle on the table. Right. right. Jack, I'm just curious, was there anything specific you can point to in, in the lake that you didn't like? Was it the tannin or the balance? Well, you know what, what? Was it? It, it might be because I drank it first. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I set the scores from there. Um, so it, it's hard to say, you know, I have to go back. I still have it on my table, you know, and, and, and try it again. I, I also found it like um, it needed to breathe and I didn't give it a chance yeah. to breathe. And so you can't, you know, you know, you, you know, how you drink wine and like it taste doesn't taste so great in the beginning. And then like 15 minutes later, you pick it up and it tastes really good. I yeah. mean, you know, I, I'd have to try the lake, you know, and, and see that. You, you know, know what I find interesting, Jack, is that if you look at the wine group that we're on on Facebook, you right. know, you talk, a lot of the guys will talk about a wine that suddenly is miraculously better after two or three days, which is kind of incredible. I, okay, so I, I don't, I just don't find that ever. I know. Um, hmm. All right, look at this is Steve, this is fun, you know. It's like, uh, <laughs> are you guys all like, are you all into wine? Where you like, you know, you talk about it and you taste it and you share it, and it's just, um, it's just really great. It's all good. It's all yeah. Good. What would our what would our great grandparents think of this though? <laughs> Give me the conquered grape. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> Where's the man in the Yeah. Anyhow. All right, guys. Lila Tove. Lila Tove. It's been great. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care.
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I can eat chicken. Then. You can. And turkey. <laughs> oh, you by can. the way. Yes. How? Do you have ice? Ice? No, ice wine. Like ice wine? Yeah, this is, they make, which is like very, very, very sweet. Though. No, I didn't have that. I mean, super sweet. Oh, super sweet? I'm not going to. Yeah. Which is very contrary to what you were saying in terms of uh, wines that are grown in. Uh, no, no, we're talking about, you know, we're, you, you're talking about grapes that are not sweet to start with, that are sweet to start with. Oh, I see. We're talking yeah. about what I say is like relatively sweet, meaning if you compare between two types of yeah. yeah. you know, so that's what, what, what I'm talking about. Yeah, a little bit sweeter than the other, but it's still like what we call white. Um, Thank you. Thank you. You get questions on the way home. No, I need to create another uh, another um, couple of sets for people that, that couldn't make it today. And then, uh, that's crazy. Crazy. But anyway, it was wonderful. Done with the computer, sir? Sorry? You're done with the computer? Yes, I'm done with the computer. Okay. Thank you. No. It doesn't sit on with that. Yeah. Um, wait. Uh, a lot of left over. I know. Well, no, this is, I, I still have to do, I still like to do a couple of um, deliveries, like, you know, I have to pick up.